Heavensward could have easily been a mixed blessing for Final Fantasy XIV. The game had finally lived up to its potential with the expansion, but it could have also marked the MMO's golden era that longtime players always hearken back to when complaining how the game has degraded since then, like World of Warcraft's Burning Crusade or Wrath of the Lich King. Whatever followed needed to reach even higher to prove that Heavensward was not a fluke. The next step for Final Fantasy XIV turned out to be Stormblood, an expansion that tries to take the improvements of Heavensward and bring them back into a story that feels closer to A Realm Reborn. Synthesizing elements of the first two entries is a classic formula for the third entry in a series, but risks becoming a lesser version of each. It would take an expansion of scope, fresh ideas that land on the first try, and follow through on elements previous installments left hanging for Stormblood to make an impact comparable to Heavensward. A lofty goal that, in my opinion, Stormblood exceeds. The lead up to Stormblood at the head of Heavens were left no question as to what the expansion would focus on. All out war between the Aeorzean Alliance and the Garlean Empire. Perhaps a bit tame of a concept when compared to the high fantasy feud with dragons that Heavens were highlighted. Going into the expansion, I was less than enthused. I felt that I was able to already guess each plot point and story beat I was about to experience. What surprised me the most was that even though I was, that didn't hamper my enjoyment whatsoever. The strength of Stormblood's narrative comes not from its ingenuity, but the quality and detail with which it regales a classic story of war. The nation of Alamigo was conquered by the Garlean Empire over 20 years ago, and has served as the Empire's foothold in the continent of Eorzea ever since. This much has been known since A Realm Reborn, likewise the occupation of Doma in the Far East. It was inevitable that liberating the two lands would be a story arc at some point in 14's long lifespan. Still. It must be commended that the seeds of Stormblood's story were planted so long in advance. It's unclear whether or not the developers have all of Final Fantasy XIV's story planned out, or if they instead come up with it as they go, picking and choosing what elements to expand on. Whatever their method is, they've proven themselves effective at setup and payoff. Stormblood picks up directly where the patch 3.55 left off, with Eorzea taking control of the Alamegan border. The path forward is clear. Carve away at occupied lands bit by bit with the help of resistance fighters in the country. To that end, the start of the expansion finds the player traveling across the land of Giravania to a town called Rolgar's Reach. The Resistance controls the area, and considers it their headquarters. This opening section is structured in a way that's eerily close to Heavensward. To ingratiate yourself to the people of this new land, you must perform odd jobs for two different quest givers, tackling whichever quest chain you want first. Surely Rolgar's Reach is the new Ishgard, or Waking Sands, or Rising Stones, a location that the player will be returning to constantly throughout the whole expansion. The time taken to help the Alamegan resistance is an improvement over Heavens where it's analog at least. The Alamegans have many different perspectives on their current plight. The resistance obviously is determined to free their home, but the occupation has been so long and their forces so few that only the most die-hard loyalists remain certain of their victory. Less and less of the youth are taking up arms, with the newest generation being born into empire rule and accepting it. Others, who are older, are too broken by the repeated losses and abuses to fight back. Some even detest the resistance, begging them to stop lest they get even more innocent people killed. The outlook is dire to say the least, but Eorzea has just come off a victory at the border, and the Warrior of Light has nary known failure. This makes it all the more shocking when you return to a burning Rolgar's Reach at the end of the quest chains. The Alamegans' fear of the Empire's retribution is not unfounded. Imperial forces, led by Xenos Ye Galvis, nearly burned Rolgar's Reach to the ground. What remained of the resistance has been cut down even further, and morale has left at near zero. Xenos goes on to be the primary antagonist of Stormblood, and this one scene sets him up to be a far greater threat than any that has come before. He single-handedly takes out entire squadrons, and the fight against him is a guaranteed failure. The most shocking display of his abilities is when he manages to cut through Yastola's magical barrier and mortally wound her. Seeing the blood fly from her mouth had me certain that she would die, but luckily healers were able to reach her in time. Even if he didn't kill her, Xenos establishes himself as the most threatening presence in 14 thus far. The other aspect that heightens this moment is how gameplay factors into it. Final Fantasy XIV has, up to now, relegated the most impactful story beats to cutscenes. And while cutscenes are used here, the player has to physically fight through Imperial soldiers, playing a part in the attack firsthand. Even with the low amount of models XIV can have on screen at the same time, Square has done a great job of, at making the sequence feel like an assault. Friendly NPCs are scattered all over, fighting their own battles as fires engulf the friendly town. This culminates in the aforementioned fight against Xenos, in which your attacks barely make a dent in his health bar. Honestly, 
It isn't the most impressive gameplay segment in the grander gaming landscape, but it certainly stands out in Final Fantasy XIV. With Rolgar's reach in disrepair and the resistance decimated, there's no clear next step toward all Amigos' liberation. The solution turns out to be on the other side of the world, in the land of Doma. The Scions decide to turn their attention to liberating the subjugated Far East in hopes of dividing the Empire's attention. The outline of the rest of Stormblood is now visible as the player travels across the sea to Kugane. Conceptually, All Amigo and Doma don't stand out as much as the floating islands of Dravania or the techno wonderland of Azisla, but they're no less interesting. The nations of Eorzea have been crafted after fantasy stereotypes, such as Wood Elves for Gadania or a pirate coalition for Limsa Lamensa. Giribania, the land Alamigo was built on, is much harder to place. There doesn't seem to be a solitary analog the area was based on, and it's quite hard to pick up any one trait and extrapolate inspiration from there. Players are first introduced to its autumnal woods, with bright red and green leaves hanging above a pleasant grove. This soon gives way to pure desert, the climate that encompasses most of Giribania. Elsewhere, there are canyons and badlands, even a savanna. Finding a cultural analog is equally troublesome. There's a deep-rooted tradition of martial arts, but it's also the home of the musketeer-like red mages. There are snake people tribes in the desert who summon a version of the Hindu goddess Lakshmi. There's a ziggurat in the savanna, suggesting perhaps Mesopotamian influence, but the architecture appears more Mesoamerican. All these disparate elements are still able to come together and make Giribania feel like a lived-in place with a unique history, and made exploring it more enticing than what you might expect from a desert. The inspiration for Doma, on the other hand, is excessively easy to identify. Pop quiz! What might the land of ninjas and samurai be based on? If there is any doubt, seeing the kimonos and lanterns of Kugane certifies it as Fantasy Japan. It's the most blatant real-world inspiration the game has taken so far, and the parallels don't stop there. Kugane is a port town on a large island off the coast of Doma proper. The rest of this island is off-limits to foreigners, making Kugane a direct analog to the port of Dejima, the only port open to foreigners in Japan during its 1700s isolationist period. Across the Ruby Sea is the kingdom of Doma proper, in a land known as Yansha. If the X in this name didn't give it away, Yansha is clearly based on China. Its bright red walls tower just as tall as the sheer cliffs that climb into the mist above. The ground below is spotted with settlements and rice paddies, and tigers roam the roads between. To the north of that is the Asim Steppe, cultural home of the Al Ra, a draconic race that my player character happens to be. Its nomadic warrior tribes, yurts, and sheep make it clear that it's Mongolia, if the long stretches of flat open plains wasn't evidence enough. At the top of the continent is the frigid home of the Garleans, placing them as Russia in the fantasy Asia that the continent of authored clearly is. All fantasy cliches are steeped in real-world inspiration, but crafting Highland's Eastern Hemisphere as such a one-to-one -one image to real-world Asia is a curious move. That isn't to say Final Fantasy XIV doesn't inject any ideas of its own, the Aura tribes in particular have a fascinating culture, and this stark contrast to Eorzea does make Authored feel like a separate continent. Stormblood's structure is the most obvious way it attempts to stand out from what came before. There's no permanent home the player branches from, Stormblood instead mimics the classic Final Fantasy game, with the player traveling across disparate lands, making temporary allies, solving local problems, and moving to the next location. The many threads are then tied together at the end, as the player confronts the primary threat with the help of the allies and resources they've gathered during their adventure. This description may sound similar to A Realm Reborn, but that followed more of a Monster of the Week structure, with the player fighting primals and returning to the Scion's headquarters and interactions with the different factions of Eorzea served more as world-building than anything that tied directly to the plot. Stormblood's adventures across Alamigo, the Ruby Sea, Doma, and the Asim Steppe all feed back into the primary goal of freeing lands from Empire control. Each step feeding back into the plot leads to Stormblood having impeccable pacing, sparing the player from the distractions that plagued 14 before. Even though Heavensward made strides to improve this, it still made constellations to fit the structure of an MMO, with temporary sidetracks to fight a primal or help an entertaining yet inconsequential beast tribe. Stormblood certainly features the odd quest or two that feel like filler, but each quest line makes tangible progress to stopping the Empire or gaining allies. If I had to summarize the difference between Heavensward and Stormblood, it would be thus. Heavensward is devoted to making a high-quality MMO experience on all fronts, from story to gameplay to multiplayer content, while Stormblood focuses on making a great Final Fantasy game that happens to be an MMO. This difference is most notable in the expansion's dungeons. Heavensward's dungeons and bosses were a noticeable step above a Realm Reborn, and on some fronts could be seen as better than those in Stormblood. However, many of Heavensward's dungeons felt like the developers thought of a cool idea for a dungeon first, and then orchestrated the narrative to warrant including it. The Great Google Library is a great example of this. 
It remains my favorite dungeon, with its imaginative theming and eccentric music placing it in a unique area of my brain, but its narrative importance is minimal at best. Stormblood's dungeons, instead, feel like the narrative was written first, with the developers then finding which points in the story would best fit a dungeon. None of the dungeons feel as inspired as the library. In fact, most are fairly tame. A stop on an island as you cross the sea, a tribal trial, an assault on a castle. They don't sound impressive on paper, but each feels like a necessary note in the story, taking moments that might have been a cutscene before and fleshing them out into the highlights of the whole experience. Gameplay design is what pushes the dungeons and bosses of Stormblood just past those of Heavensward. With few exceptions, dungeons have been hallway runs through enemies with three or four bosses placed throughout. Stormblood dungeons don't deviate too far from this, but the hallways tend to have something more interesting. The first dungeon transitions from defending a ship at sea to fighting through an island when the ship crashes. Doma Castle is an assault on a fort, and as such sees players dodging artillery and cannons as they fight defending forces. Boss fights nonetheless remain the highlight. 14 has had a steady ramp of difficulty as the main story progresses, but most challenges have been reserved for optional high-level variations on the encounters. Stormblood is the first expansion in which I regularly died on my first encounter with each boss. Part of this is due to simple balancing. Boss attack patterns are building upon what players have seen before, so they're more frantic, complex, and deal more damage. The other half of the increase in difficulty is the experimentation with gimmicks and not yet seen creativity. For example, one boss in the Bardom's Metal Dungeon asks players to not attack the boss. Instead, they must dodge sets of increasingly difficult attack patterns as a group. If one player is hit, an X displays over their head and they are locked in place. If they succeed, a check mark is displayed instead. If at least one player makes it through, the group is freed from the chains and they move on to the next round of attacks. After several rounds, the fight ends without a single point of damage dealt to the enemy. It's captivating on multiple levels. A novel concept for a dungeon boss that perhaps other MMOs have done, but 14 has not. It tests player skills not in the combat mechanics, but specifically in the skill set required to handle the game's boss fights. Lastly, the theme of the dungeon is a cultural rite of passage, so it's completely within reason that the gauntlet would test multiple aspects of a person's capabilities. The placement of the boss in the middle of the dungeon instead of the end gives it a unique pace, and leaves room for the dungeon to still offer the big boss fight at the end that players might be wanting. Exercising creativity and playing with established mechanics is all well and good, but experiments can often come with downsides. Take the fight against Lakshmi as an example of this. Just as much a visual spectacle of the best primal fights, featuring yet another incredible song, the Lakshmi fight incorporates a unique action that can only be used in that fight. The effect of this ability is hard to parse from its simple icon, and activating it does little to solve this. The intended use of this ability is to interact with spheres of light that periodically spawn. Doing so creates a bubble that players must stand in to avoid an instant kill move. Intuiting this interaction is not impossible, but it isn't so obvious that all players will know what to do. In the grand scheme, it's a minor issue, as any repeat plays of the encounter will bring with it the knowledge of the mechanic. But as Final Fantasy XIV's boss mechanics grow in complexity, communicating the correct course of action to the player will become more and more difficult. Luckily, this is all legacy content, so all a new player really needs to do is watch what the more experienced players that they will inevitably be grouped with are doing and follow suit. The job that I decided to tackle all these dungeons and bosses as is Red Mage. Having previously played a melee DPS and a tank, the obvious choice would be to try a healing class. The prospect is a bit too intimidating for me, however. Having the group rely on me to live through dungeons is a bit too much pressure for someone who isn't playing the game for multiplayer content, and the idea of rapidly targeting while using a controller is even scarier. Red Mage served to be an excellent compromise. As a DPS caster class, it deals most of its damage in the backline as it channels various spells. It also includes a healing spell and a revive, so they can serve as a healing class in a pinch. It's easily the most complicated job I've played thus far. The Red Mage rotation is centered around his black and white mana meter. Each spell the Red Mage casts adds mana to either the black or white side of the meter. It's important to balance the two, as if one side gets too much higher than the other, the lower side becomes harder to raise. When both sides reach a certain threshold, the mana can be spent on a high damage melee combo with the Red Mage's rapier that finishes in a devastating flare or holy spell. On top of that, when one spell finishes casting, the next can be cast instantly, meaning that it's important to only cast the spells that fire faster and use the higher damaging spells as the instant cast. I didn't go into much detail on the Dragoon or Dark Knight mechanics in previous videos because there wasn't much to say. They both mostly stick to a straightforward combo for reliable damage, with Dark Knight having touches of spellcasting mixed in. 
The many elements that the Red Mage must manage on top of dealing with the increased mechanical complexity of the encounters in Stormblood resulted in an invigorating change of pace that constantly demanded my attention, a stark contrast to the Dragoon in particular. It's also possible that the immobility and low defense of the Red Mage played a part in the difficulty increase that I experienced in the expansion, or that I had become too accustomed to the survivability of a tank. The Red Mage quest line doesn't compare to the Dark Knight as favorably as the class itself, however. I couldn't speak highly enough of the Dark Knight quests, with its meta-messaging and player character expanding narrative remaining as my favorite experience in 14 thus far. With the bar that high, the Red Mage quest really didn't have much of a chance to begin with. Still, it's not without its notable qualities. The mentor, Zeruntia, paints a compelling picture of the ideal red mage, landing himself somewhere between the Three Musketeers and Zoro, lending the job a desirable fantasy for the player to reach towards. It also does a nice job of tying itself to Stormblood's plot, with the red magic practice originating in Alamigo, and Zeruntia being the one who taught Alice in her fighting style. The antagonist of the quest turns out to be a vampire, essentially, giving the side story a fun flavor I haven't seen elsewhere in the game. Not much else can be said about the Red Mage quests, except it featured the first example of my favorite change in Stormblood, an increased focus on improving the single-player quests. The fight against the Vampire was a fully involved boss fight that would fit right into any of the game's dungeons. It was difficult in the way no single-player instance has been this far, and took 5 or 10 minutes for just the one fight. I was shocked at the quality. Even the most important single-player fights were short breezes before. I thought it was a fluke, but this turned out to be the standard for Stormblood. The attack on Rolgars reach just one of many large-scale battles that the player takes place in, and each of them feels just as large, even with the minimal resources. The Vampire is just one of many single-player bosses as well. It doesn't stop at making solo combat instances more engaging either. The main story quest throws a number of unique gimmicks at the player, ranging from a stealth mission through a city to inspecting monsters with a camera to find a weak point. My personal favorite is the stealth assault on an Empire camp in Doma, in which the player must shoot sleep darts at soldiers from a distance to get inside the facility, after which you must don a disguise to trick the Watchmen. Some missions involve a whole new mode of travel that Stormblood adds, deep sea diving. The most memorable quest of this type being the search for an important item on a wrecked ship at the bottom of the sea. There's even a rematch against Laxmi that's entirely located in a single player quest. Instead of other players helping you, important characters fight by your side. In moments like this, I completely forgot that I was playing an MMO. This new effort put into creating single-player content slides Final Fantasy XIV into the same headspace as other mainline Final Fantasy games. It also shows a redoubled commitment to the game's story and characters. Having the NPCs you talk to actually get involved and help in gameplay goes a long way in helping them feel like comrades. Actually getting to play as them is on a whole other level. There are quests in which you get to fight as Alfino, Yastola, and Hien. These are my favorite quests in the whole game, as I was genuinely blindsided by their appearance. The moveset each character has is simplistic, but do give a taste at what some jobs you may not have yet played can do, as well as show the capabilities of your companions firsthand. I loved Alfino already, but now that he's technically a playable character, my attachment is through the roof. Characters would join here and there in battles before, but their help was minimal and the difficulty of those encounters was too low for their contribution to be noticed anyway. Now, I'm grateful that Lys was there to help me fight Lakshmi. Lys is the poster character for Stormblood. For the first time since A Realm Reborn, Alfino takes somewhat of a back seat. Lys is unequivocally the protagonist of Stormblood, participating in all of its main story beats, even narrating the game's cutscenes. Previously known as Ida, she was the hot-headed young scion who chose to fight with her fists. She always sat comfortably in the background, but when her mentor and partner Papalimo sacrificed himself right before the expansion, she revealed her true identity and gained the resolve to free her homeland of Alamigo. She retains much of her candy spirit, endlessly pumping up the Alamigan resistance and arguing with any citizens who have lost hope. It's only after Olga's reach is attacked that she realizes it'll take more than being a go-getter to win this conflict. Over the course of the story, Lise makes impressive strides in maturing without losing who she is. Instead of being frustrated with the outlook of the commoners, she learns their perspective and speaks with more and more calm compassion. Her efforts in the war for Doman Liberation seems especially formative for her, with her taking in the ideas and philosophies of the far-off land as they struggle through the same situation her home is in. It's this quiet development that leaves her the prime candidate to lead the freed Alamigo. Seeing this spitfire grow from background character to leader of a nation in the Aorzean Alliance over the course of a single expansion is quite impressive, 
and the writer should be commended for packing this much development into this time frame and still making it believable. It's good that Lisa's character arc is so engaging, because the new cast that Stormblood introduces doesn't offer much on their own. Alamigo and Doma need their own stable of characters to feel as lived in as the other nations, and Stormblood provides this. The new cast is thankfully pleasant, there isn't any character worth disliking, but they also don't offer much. He ends the leader of Doma, and as such, gets a good amount of screen time in the second half of the story. He's a noble samurai leader with a touch of relatable charm. That covers Hien. Enjoyable enough, but his personal struggle is exactly what you would expect from his archetype. The same goes for many of Stormblood's new characters, like Alamegan resistance leader Conrad, or his right-hand woman Monago. The one exception to this is Gosetsu, the aged bodyguard of Lord Hien. He is also one note for much of the story, but the rescue of Hien has him realize his survivor's guilt after fleeing Doma. His sacrifice during the attack on Doma Castle can be seen as cliché, and the scene itself is quite ridiculous in how long he holds the crumbling castle, but his determination to not fail Lord Hien a second time is strongly felt. After this fake-out death in the post-game patches is where the interesting elements of his character come into play. His wounds have left him utterly unable to fight, and a young woman has been placed in his care. He's lost the ability to do the one thing that defined him, and the girl he protects reminds him of his failure to protect his own daughter during Doma's conquest. Seeing him struggle to come to terms with the end of his former life that he's clung to for over 20 years is heart-wrenching. Having him come out of it with a new goal in life is an inspirational symbol for all of Doma's people post-war. The cast of Allies may fall a bit flat overall, but Stormblood goes above and beyond making up for this with its excellent rogues gallery. Final Fantasy XIV has had a bit of an issue with its villains up to this point. Gaius von Belsir from A Realm Reborn made for an intimidating silhouette, but the character himself was little beyond the Final Fantasy staple calm yet firm general. Heavensward technically had two villains in Ned Hogg and King Thornton, but the real villain of that story was ostensibly the concept of revenge. Stormblood has three excellent villains, each memorable for their own reasons, one on each side of the war, and one managing both sides of it. Xenos Ye Galvis is that central villain. He's easily the most memorable villain the game has had, and that's without him even being that nuance. In fact, it's his simplicity that makes him so entertaining. He wears the biggest armor in the world. He only cares about fighting a worthy opponent, and loves nothing more than violence and struggle. He's from the Empire, but uses Doman katanas because they're just so cool. He has a revolver sheath, the most impractical yet best character design element in Final Fantasy XIV. By all accounts, he should be a joke of a character. But then he nearly kills Yustola, decimates a whole army, and squashes the player. He absolutely backs up his over-the-top image, leaving you with no choice but to respect it. There's no hidden desire or crushing backstory. He's simply a monster who likes to kill things and is good at it. Xenos is the perfect example of Stormblood relying on executing cliches well instead of subverting expectations. The other two villains are a much different story, each being perhaps the most nuanced character the game has yet offered. They are Fordola and Yotsuyu, traitors from Alamigo and Doma, respectively. They share similarities on a surface level. Each was born in the lands they subjugate, and each betrayed their home due to the abuses of the common folk. Past that, however, they contrast each other to form an incredibly well-rounded view of how people can be driven to heinous acts in times of war, and how they might come to terms with their actions. Fordola is a high-ranking soldier in the Imperial Army on the Alamegan front. She quickly ingratiates herself to Xenos, taking primary control of the Empire's forces when he becomes occupied elsewhere. It's clear from the way that other soldiers treat her, and the gossip from the Alamegan people, that she's native to Girabania. Her reasons for betraying her home are unclear, though she mentions that she did what she did for the good of Alamigo. Several scenes show the racist abuse she endures from her officials, being called a beast and a savage. It's interesting how much time is put into making her sympathetic during the main story, because an equal amount of time is devoted to showing her growing callousness. When she's put in charge, she takes time to intimidate some of the beast tribes, even a faction that's technically allied with the Empire. When the Eorzean forces try to take an Imperial stronghold, she gives the order to launch the Empire's Mega Artillery as her own forces are still fighting, specifically other Alamegan defectors, sacrificing them to spite the resistance. After one of her failures, Xenos forces her to undergo an experimental operation, implanting in her a synthetic version of the Echo. This turns her into an unstoppable fighter, capable of reading her opponent's moves before they even act, as well as giving her the memory reading capabilities others with the Echo have. 
When finally confronted, she spells out her reasoning in a scene that felt oddly relevant to the real world. She had long ago resigned herself to empire rule, and instead of fighting for freedom, decided that she had to prove she could overcome the negative perceptions Garleans have of Alamegans. As she climbed the ranks, she came to realize that being good would never be enough. She has to be the best, not just the best, but so far past the best that no one could possibly think less of her for her race. Her specific quote of having to run faster and work harder than anyone else really hit home the real-world parallels to her situation. Still, sympathy doesn't excuse evil. By the end game, she's defeated and captured, with Lise choosing to spare her in the hopes that she can make up for her sins. The post-game is where her development really begins. The player sees Fordola's past through the Echo, a vision of a young Fordola with her parents being stoned in the town square for being Imperial loyalists. It's much easier to understand the lack of love she has for her own people. Locked in her cell, with her new Echo abilities, she's unwillingly subjected to seeing the memories of the guards of the prison, seeing firsthand the way she killed their loved ones, and feeling their emotions. This multiplies the weight of her guilt, having her beg to be executed. Lise refuses to grant her this, instead wanting her to live and realize the error of her ways. Fordola's story culminates in her coming to the rescue during the surprise fight against the primal Lakshmi, walking back to her cell on her own once the fight is done. I wouldn't be surprised if Fordola saves the day in some other fight down the line, but if not, this last gesture is a perfect balance of showing her growth without absolving her of her sins. Yotsuyu, in contrast, is an unrepentant monster who derives the utmost glee from inflicting pain on the people of Doma. She is as over the top as Xenos, but from a different angle. She maintains the confidence of an experienced woman, always leisurely strolling to her different torture appointments, half-heartedly holding a smoking pipe in one hand. Her introduction sees her forcing a young man to shoot his own parents to prove his loyalty to the Empire, with the same demeanor someone might try to sell you perfume. When challenged, however, she explodes with a deep anger, beating victims within an inch of their life. Less effort is put into making her sympathetic than Fordola, but there are gestures towards it. Her parents died when she was a child, and she was left in the care of some relatives. They treated her exceptionally poorly, forcing her to do hard labor while their biological son received all the favor. When she came of age, the father of the family sold her into prostitution. Just as with Fordola, the disdain for her people is understandable. Unlike Fordola, Yotsuyu has unrestrained disgust and disdain for the Domans, completely buying into the Empire's concept of them as beasts. She is supposedly crushed with Doma Castle and Gosetsu at the end of Doman Quest Chain, a fitting end for such a despicable creature. Her story does not end there, though. Just as Gosetsu, she managed to survive and escape the castle. The scars that she carries from the incident are not physical like Gosetsu's, however. Yotsuyu has lost all of her memories and has seemingly reverted to a childlike state. She is the young woman that Gosetsu cares for in the postgame. This turn of events was, initially, my least favorite aspect of Stormblood's story. 14 seemed to be building a bit of a pattern of walking back its most lasting consequences. This reservation made the development of the plotline even more satisfying. Following the manipulation of her old stepbrother, Yotsuyu regains her memories. The childlike innocence of her new self and kindness she received from Gosetsu make her past atrocities too much to bear, and she attempts to end her own life. Further manipulation from her stepbrother stops her in the act, instead leading her to murder her former caretakers. Killing yet again breaks Yotsuyu, realizing that she never had any hope of being a decent person. She complies with her stepbrother's plans, turning into a primal. This fight is once again visually stunning, but one element pushes it to the top tier. The midpoint of the fight sees her reverting to her human state, crumpled on the ground in despair as ghosts of her past attack her. The players must defeat the shades of her caretakers, Doman citizens, and her stepbrother before they cause her too much suffering. The final shade is Xenos, as he attempts to end her for failing him one too many times. A shade of Gosetsu intervenes, blocking Xenos' blade and giving the players a chance to stop him. The memory of Gosetsu haunts Yotsuyu, ultimately becoming one more regret she won't get over. She resigns to her fate yet again, taking her primal form as the players must kill her. Her last act before death is killing her stepbrother, finally getting revenge on the last person who caused her suffering and giving her peace. It's ridiculous to absolve Yotsu of her misdeeds, but the brief window in which she was released from her trauma and was a genuinely caring person shows that, despite what she may believe herself, Yotsuyu did have a chance at a better life. Though most of the story revolves around Lise and the new cast of characters, the old standby still have a presence. Ali Say would be the stand of this lot, stepping in where Alfino would have before. In many ways, she could be seen as Alfino would better. 
She still retains a knack for diplomacy, though she feels less positively when engaging in it, and her combat prowess far exceeds that of her brother. Much like her brother, though, her strengths also tend to be her weakness. Whereas Alfino's analytical nature can make him an excellent strategist, but also leave him paralyzed in dire situations, Alice's lack of patience gives her the ability to act quickly and efficiently, sometimes jumping into danger she could have avoided. This is exactly what happens when she confronts the enhanced Fordola, being struck down in one slice and put out of commission for the remainder of the war. A mistake not only Alice, but Alfino as well, resents. Alice learns to be a bit more careful, but Alfino learns to be more proactive once he realizes how quickly he could lose his sister. He puts himself in danger more after this point, even volunteering to go alone to Garlemald itself when the opportunity arises. The change is also reflected in how he treats Alice, ordering her to stay behind in support roles in missions she could otherwise be on the front lines for. It frustrates Alice, but she understands where he's coming from. I spent a long time discussing the characters as opposed to the plot itself, but that's because of Stormblood's predictable nature. The various steps to prepare for battles and gambits the resistant armies engage in are clever and fun, but they're just flavor on a straightforward narrative. The character moments and development are absolutely what stands out in Stormblood, from its opening cutscene to its climactic finale. The plot takes center stage once again after the credits roll. So much ground is covered in a small number of quests. The Empire's true goals, as well as the goals of the Asians, finally become clear. This is a mystery that has been hanging in the air since some of a Realm Reborn's earliest moments, and the truth behind them is more dire than I could have anticipated. Garlemald has shown themselves to be racist before, thinking of Eorzeans as lesser peoples who need a strong leader to guide them, but the depths of their racism were far greater than previously known. Garlians see themselves as genetically superior to all other races, harking back to the real-world scientific racism that took root in the 1800s. Racism proves to not just be a trait of the Garlians, but also their primary motivation. Long ago, the world shattered into multiple different worlds, with each having its own quirks and imperfections. The current emperor, Varys Sost Galvis, believes that the presence of any non-human race was one of these imperfections that arose back then. He aims to fold all the worlds back into one, reverting life to one pure race of humanity. If you want your villains to be hated, having their goal be racial purity isn't a bad place to start, but the diabolical nature of the Empire doesn't stop there. Garlemald's history turns out to be intertwined with the goals of the Asians. The Asians seek to maintain a balance of light and dark in the world. To that end, one Asian took the name Solas Vosgalvis and founded the Garlean Empire years ago. Past the current Emperor's goals, the Empire was explicitly created to sow chaos in the world and increase the presence of darkness to combat the light. Their goals known, and an even greater war on the horizon? Surely this must be all the setup needed for the next expansion. But it doesn't stop there. The Sirens of the Seventh Dawn begin to hear a voice in their heads, warning of an impending calamity and begging them to throw open the gates. An ominous message to be sure, compounded by the fact that Thancred seemingly falls dead afterwards. After inspecting him, it's learned that his body still lives, but his soul has seemingly disappeared entirely. One by one, each Scion succumbs to this fate. Yustola, Iriange, Alfino, Alice. Each is left an unmoving husk. All that remains are Tataru and the newest recruits, but they can hardly be counted on to fight the war. The outlook has never looked more grim. Based on the setup alone, I'm beginning to see why Shadowbringers is spoken of so highly. The prospect of an expansion that's even greater than Stormblood is endlessly exciting. Heavensward proved Final Fantasy XIV's quality of writing as well as its narrative creativity, while Stormblood fleshed out and polished all other aspects of the experience to a mirror sheen. A redoubled effort toward varied objectives and unique combat encounter designs have pushed the gameplay past fun for an MMO to simply fun. The attention to detail and care of execution in the game's world and characters have left me dying to jump back in. I previously said that Heavensward was the game a Realm Reborn promised to be, but I see now that I was wrong. With its classic tale of war, memorable villains, globe-trotting adventure, and a cast worth caring about, that title goes to Stormblood. I hope you enjoyed the video. I know Heaven's Word has the better reputation, but I hope I was able to convey what made Stormblood so special to me. In the next video, I'll be finishing Final Fantasy XIV as it stands right now with the most recent expansion, Shadowbringers. Thanks for watching.